This is a story of two parts. The first is my own story, told from the perspective of my 11-year-old self, while the second part is told from that of my late father's. In September of 1989, just after my 11th birthday, my parents loaded up all of our stuff into a car and moved us all the way from Pennsylvania, steel country, to Rhode Island. The move was sudden to say the least and neither myself nor my older sister were particularly happy about it, but mom explained that dad had secured a very good job out there and we could use the extra money to buy us new bikes, horse riding lessons, and all that good stuff, you get the idea. So we get there and the house was amazing. It was brand new but still looked super old and fancy and according to my parents the best thing was that it was free. The house was provided for anyone who held the position my dad had recently acquired, which was the vice principal of the very fancy private school we'd be going to. That didn't really mean much to us kids though. We were more than swayed by the promise of new bikes, but the thing that really won us over were our new bedrooms. They were huge compared to our old rooms and when mom and dad said that we could help furnish them ourselves on a little trip into Newport, me and my sister were walking on air. We'd gone from very unhappy about the move to positively ecstatic, but as time went on, things started to seem really, really off. The first thing I noticed was how our new place was compared to all the other homes and buildings around the township. The place was nothing but old money New England elite, and it had the architecture to match. Most homes dated back to the 1800s, and some of the older cottages were built back to the 1680s. We weren't exactly complaining about that, better to live in some new build than some rickety old cottage, no matter how storied it was, but the contrast was something that we picked up on as time went by. The second thing I noticed was the way people looked at our house whenever they passed. I remember looking out of my dad's office window one day when I spotted a kid riding down our street on his little red line BMX, the exact same kind of bike I wanted. Our house was one of only three on that street. All real big houses, nicely spaced out. So when he slowed to a stop outside of ours, I found myself hoping that he was about to come and kind of hit up the new kid in the town, which might allow me to try out my dream bike way earlier than expected. But then, instead of getting off of his bike and walking up to our driveway, the kid just stared at our house with this real nervous look on his face. I started to wave and I quickly managed to get his attention, but instead of waving back or anything, the kid jumped right back on his bike and went back the way he came, as if I'd suddenly spooked him or something. I honestly figured that it was a me problem, that the kids at school were going to treat me like an outcast or something and it really bummed me out. But as I came to find out, what was spooking that kid was nothing to do with me. It was the house. Speaking of school, I didn't notice the third weird thing until me and my sister had started classes. The kids didn't treat me like a leper, and to my infinite relief, they were actually pretty welcoming. At least until they found out who I was and where I lived, and that's when I started acting strange. Two things seemed to trigger the reaction, either mentioning where we'd moved into or mentioning what my dad's new job was. I'd be talking to some kid, get along with them, making a friend, and they'd just switch whenever I'd mention the job or the house. They wouldn't exactly run away screaming or anything, but there would always be a noticeable shift in their attitude towards me. And that continued for weeks, until I finally found out what had happened up at that house. It took an unusually long time for us kids to find out, but that was down to almost everyone in town adhering to an unofficial code of silence. But that didn't last though, and weirdly enough, the kids lasted longer than the adults did. I guess that's just because they knew less about it, but they still knew that it was bad, and bad enough they didn't need to have some moratorium imposed on them, they just didn't want to discuss it at all. Until finally, a kid I'd made friends with told me the truth of why our house was so new, and why some folks stopped and stared whenever they walked by. About six months before we'd moved in, there had been a fire at the old vice principal's house. The only survivor had been the guy's wife, while the VP and his three children had all sadly lost their lives. Everyone had decided that the place was haunted, so instead of just fixing the place up, it was torn down entirely before a new house was built in its place. At least, that's what my buddy told me, and in case it wasn't obvious from the whole haunted thing, that wasn't quite how things happened. 
My dad, on the other hand, he got the full story, something he soon passed along to my mom, and once us kids found out the half story, it triggered a kind of crisis. We didn't want to stay there anymore, convinced that the ghosts of the old VP and his three kids were wandering the halls at night, and mom wasn't going to keep us there if we were going to end up sleepless and traumatized. And that's how my parents ended up separating for a while, at least, until the bad juju in that house got to dad too and we ended up getting a place in Newport with my dad commuting to and from school. I didn't find out what really happened in that house until many years later and when I did, I wondered how my dad could have slept in that place alone for a single night, ghosts or not. According to him, the whole story starts with this kid named Freddie Washbach. Freddie was a rich kid, but that didn't mean that he was immune to regular old teenage angst. He was into heavy metal, he stole his sister's nail polish, and spent most of his time hanging out with other punks over in the city. He wasn't just the black sheep of his family, he was the black sheep of the whole township by the sounds of things, and he was forever falling foul of the late vice principal, as they would say. This vice principal had apparently taken a personal interest in straightening out young Freddy, and whenever his behavior started to slip, he'd called Freddy into his office for an impromptu disciplinary action. Apparently, this continued for an extended period of time, and Freddy's behavior did actually improve somewhat. But as it did, Freddy became increasingly withdrawn. His parents were overjoyed at the improvement and apparently saw his sort of melancholy attitude as a form of emotional growing pains. They figured that he'd be over his little rebellious phase in time for college applications and all that, but neither Freddy nor the former vice principal ever made it that far. One night, Freddy Washbuck walked all the way over to the former VP's house and knocked on the door. When the VP came to the door, Freddy produced a shotgun, then ordered the VP and his family into their TV room. Once they were all present and secured, Freddy took out a cassette tape slid it into the VP stereo system and pressed play. It wasn't the only copy of the tape. Freddy had posted the original to the chief of the Newport Police Department. He wanted the truth to come out, but as for the punishment, he was content to handle that himself. Freddy made the VP's family listen to a secret recording he'd made, one which documented the events of one of his disciplinary sessions. I don't know the exact details of it, no one really does but it's safe to say Freddy was being subjected to some of the most horrifying and venal abuse imaginable. Then, once the whole family, including the children, had heard what a soulless monster their father and husband had been, Freddy Washbach opened fire. He made sure to wing the VP and his wife. He wanted to make sure that they watched their kids die. Then, once their kids were gone, Washbach fired another few shells at the parents, and then set the house on fire, and then turned the shotgun on himself. Yet in focusing most of his rage on his abuser, Freddy had neglected to ensure that the VP's wife was dead. Somehow, she managed to drag the bodies of all three of her dead children out of the burning house and onto the lawn outside. She didn't once try to go back in for her husband. She just let his body burn, along with that of young Freddy Washbox. After giving the police a full and frank account of what had happened, leaving them in no doubt of her husband's true nature, the late VP's wife simply skipped town and was never to be seen again. The townsfolk had the place bulldozed and rebuilt and spent the next six months or so pretending the whole thing never happened. Then finally, they placed a few ads for the vice principal's position, and that's where we enter the story. As it turns out, mom and dad were basically getting the same sort of treatment as we were. Everyone was all nice and friendly with them right up until the subject of work or home came up and then just like the kids at school, they'd start acting all cagey and shifty. The school basically refused to answer any of the questions dad had regarding his predecessor and only told him stuff like he wasn't suited to the role. We were months into living there when my dad finally confronted the principal and demanded that he tell him what was going on, and that's when he found out why the salary was so generous. It was a well-paid position as it was, but the salary had been marked up as a kind of unwritten don't ask and don't tell rule, one that turned into a keep your mouth shut rule once he found out. The school had somehow managed to keep the whole thing out of the papers, at least the truth of the matter anyway, 
and although they claimed it was for the family's protection, their only interest was their own reputation. That's what really pushed my dad to leave in the end. Not what had happened or the fact that he was living over the site of such a horrific past event. It was the fact that the school wasn't prepared to put any kind of preventative safety measures in place because that would force them to actually acknowledge what had happened. The way Dad put it, it's one thing to try to move on from a sudden tragedy, but it's another to refuse to put any safeguards in place and risk the same thing happening again. It was like the school saw it as a the mess cleaning up itself sort of thing, and they refused to accept that anything like that could possibly happen again. Washbach and the VP were unique cases, a perfect alignment of disasters waiting to happen, and no amount of safeguarding could prevent it from reoccurring. It was a disgustingly fatalistic way for a school to approach such an event, and in the end, no amount of money could have kept my dad there, and at the end of his first year, he quit before taking a job near Hartford. Me and my sister remained in the dark until many years afterwards when he finally told us what had happened in that little Rhode Island township. I'm surprised the whole story still hasn't hit the news. He thinks some journalists would have found out about it by now and have the whole thing written up for the Times or the Post. But then the more I think about it, the more I realize that it's down to me to write it up. I guess this will serve as a kind of test, to see if I have the chops to actually tell the story right and if it all works out then. I guess I know what I'm going to do with my spare time for the foreseeable future. So this might be the single craziest story I've ever heard. It also is weirdly straddling this blurry line of scary and kind of funny. I think about it sometimes and it never fails to bring a smile to my face. But then at the same time, it if it was happening to me, I would definitely not be finding it funny. This is technically my old middle school buddy's story, but it's been 100% confirmed by both of his parents, and he's not writing this up in an email anytime soon, so I'm just going to tell it instead. Me and him were friends in middle school, but he ended up moving out of town for a while. We thought that that was the end of our friendship pretty much, as the place they were moving was all the way on the other side of the state. But then less than a year later, he moved right back to town as if nothing had happened. At first I was too happy to question why they'd moved back to town so quick, so I didn't. But then as time went on, I got more and more curious, so I asked my buddy why. And I swear, of all the answers I expected him to give, the one he gave was nowhere near the top 100 list. He sighed and without a hint of humor in his voice, he said, Some naked guy kept pooping in our yard. As you can probably guess, I laughed my butt off at his answer and I swear the fact that he said it with a straight face made me laugh even more. I thought it was a joke. I mean, it had to be a joke. But it wasn't. My buddy was deadly serious. I remember when he first told me we were just sitting out in his backyard and since I was friendly with his parents, having known them so long, I decided to go ask them myself. But then my buddy grabs me and with this scared, pleading look on his face, asked me not to say anything to his parents about it. And that pretty much convinced me that he was just talking crap and that it must have been part of some elaborate joke with myself very much at the center of it. But then years later, like I'd already mentioned, I found out it was 100% true. After buying the house at a discount rate from a couple who seemed desperate to leave, my buddy and his parents found out pretty quick why they were so keen to sell. Night after night, for like a week at first, a big pile of poop would appear on either the front or back lawn. The piles were so huge that at first they thought it was a bear or something, and his dad ended up staying up all night with a gun for maybe three or four nights straight until he finally caught the culprit in the act. It wasn't a bear. It was a man. A naked man, who climbed into their backyard, took a squat, and then pooped on the grass. My buddy's dad said that he was so stunned that at first all he did was watch the guy just stuck in this half-stunned, half-terrified stupor. He did his business, then climbed back over the fence and ran off into the night again. The guy called the cops, told them everything, and they gave him two options. Either shoot the guy or get a good enough photograph of him so they could ID and arrest him. And my buddy's dad chose a little bit of both. They already had a gun, so he bought himself the camera. 
not just wanting to kill the guy or let him get away so he could carry on pooping in yards. So once again, he starts staying up all night, half kind of killing himself in the process because he's still working all day too. Then one night, he catches the guy. It's also worth noting that no other yards were being pooped in around this time, so my buddy's dad was livid at the idea that he was being targeted for some reason. So then, when he finally sees the guy again, he waits until he's full squat, then rushes out with the camera and the gun to get some pictures of the guy up close. He figures he's safe because, I mean, he has a gun, but I suppose he didn't count on the guy being a complete psycho, which, considering the circumstances, he really should have. The moment he starts taking pictures, the guy just lunges at him. Only my buddy's dad doesn't quite have the instinct or the training to even fire the gun at all. He just falls back and the crazy naked pooper grabs his gun. A struggle ensues. Lots of screaming, neighbors get woken up and then finally, the naked guy wrestles the gun from my buddy's dad. I get why it must have been terrifying but the idea of this dude being naked the whole time just makes it all seem so surreal. Then he points the gun at my buddy's dad and pulls the trigger. Nothing. He tries again. Nothing. By that point, some of the neighbors were over the fence and they tackled the guy before he had a chance to cock the thing, which my friend's dad had completely forgotten to do before he confronted the phantom pooper. In that struggle, he dropped the gun and made a beeline over the fence. Luckily, he had gotten some pretty good pictures of the guy's face, and although the camera got smashed in the struggle for the gun, the cops were able to get the raw film processed. Wanted posters went up, and the guy's picture appeared on local news, and eventually he was found and arrested. Only get this, the cops let him go. I don't know how exactly they managed to screw something that big up, but somewhere down the line, someone bungled some file or evidence or something and the guy got to walk. As soon as my buddy and family hear, poof, they're gone, without even a word, went to stay with some in-laws or something before they could buy their house back from whoever or whatever realtor was holding on to it. I think in actual fact my buddy's family moved back because some psycho was going to come back and potentially kill his dad. But the way he avoided such a traumatic thought by saying someone was pooping in our yard still cracks me up even all these years later. But like I said earlier, I don't think it would have been very funny to live through, especially if it was me looking down that barrel of a gun in the hands of some naked, scat-obsessed psycho. My name is Luca, I'm a long-time subscriber, and to be honest, this story has been sitting in my draft emails for quite some time now. I wrote it up almost two years ago with every intention of sending it to you, but at the moment of truth, I lost my nerve. You see, I'm honestly not sure whether this was a genuinely creepy moment or just something that became creepy to me because I overthought it. But after reading it over, my wife thinks it's something you'd like to hear because after reading it back, she thinks it's pretty creepy too. She remembers me mentioning it, but I don't think she understood how unsettling it was in the moment. She remembers thinking the guy was being rude, which is definitely not how I remember it. I suppose this is all just confusing information, so I guess I'll get on with the story. Now, a slight epilogue here, I'm first-generation Italian-American, and my family have owned restaurants for as far back as anyone can remember. So when my father brought his expertise to Chicago, he did very well for himself. When he died, ownership fell to me, and as much as it was my honor to carry on the family tradition... The restaurant scene had become more and more competitive as the years went by. It got to the point where I wasn't making enough to comfortably put both kids through college and contribute to my retirement fund. So instead of battling it out in an already oversaturated market, I started scouting out relocation options. I don't want to name the town this whole thing happened in. I don't want to dock some poor innocent gas station owner because of some dumb misunderstanding. What I will say is that it's in the Midwest, about 20,000 people, and its proximity to a pretty decent college was a big attraction to me. It looked like a totally regular place at first. Schools, hospital, a whole lot of real nice houses too. But then the more I drove around, the more the places started to seem, I don't know, dead. If I'd paid a visit on a weekday afternoon, I could understand the place being so quiet. 
but this was a Saturday afternoon. For a town of 20,000, the main high street should have been teeming with folks all looking to make the most of their one real day of recreation. This was most of the appeal for me too. Out in those small towns, there were still the four bottles of wine in every appetizer crowds, as opposed to the Grubhub vultures who only hit you up when there are two for ones. Those were the fine people that were going to put my babies through college, but they were nowhere to be seen in this wholesome looking farmer's town that, in actual fact, didn't feel very wholesome at all. I ended up parking my car somewhere before taking a short walk up and down the high street. With the total lack of people around and I swear I counted all the foot traffic on one hand. It was a wonder some of the stores weren't all boarded up, and I started to wonder if I'd arrived during some sort of event that drew people out of town or something. I ended up asking an older lady what the deal was, intending to ask her if the town was always that quiet. But then when I approached and asked her as she made her way down the main street, she completely ignored me. I'm not talking a rude side eye and a cold shoulder, I mean, it was like I was a ghost. She just didn't even flinch as she walked past me and I'd walked right up to her to talk. It was so jarring that I actually chuckled out loud to myself and I quickly approached someone else to make sure that I wasn't totally invisible. This next person talked to me but they were far from friendly. Not outright rude but definitely on the spectrum of passive aggressive. I asked him where everyone was and he just sort of shrugged before saying something like, It's a quiet town. We like it that way. Then he excused himself and carried on about his day. Now, these were obviously not good indicators and I had pretty much made up my mind already that this wasn't the place. Then on the way out of town I saw my car's fuel gauge was getting pretty low so I pulled into a gas station on the edge of town for a little top off and that's where things got really weird. I started filling up my tank from these old looking gas pumps and I swear my eyes almost fell out of my head when I saw the price meter. It crawled up shockingly slow and I realized this gas station was selling fuel at an extremely discounted rate. Obviously this was just about the least terrifying thing I could possibly imagine and it put me in a pretty good mood as I walked into the gas station itself to pay the attendant. Inside was kind of rubish looking older man sitting behind a counter watching a little box TV and for the first time since I arrived in that little town, I actually met someone friendly. The guy was warm and welcoming and smiled when I told him how much I appreciated his gas prices. As I paid him, he asked what I was doing in town and as he opened up the register and put the bills inside, I told him. The second I mentioned the possibility of moving to town to open up a restaurant, the guy's face changed. Not a rude expression, but almost like a fearful one. Then I swear to God, he looks me dead in the eyes and says in a voice barely above a whisper, Don't move here. I heard exactly what he said, and the whole thing took me by surprise so hard that I found myself responding with, Huh? What did you say? At that, a woman I assume was the guy's wife emerged from the back rooms to see what was going on. I don't know if she actually heard what he'd said to me, but she seemed to know that something was off and after addressing her husband by name, he just totally shut down. He shot her a look with that same spooked expression then started busying himself like a child caught doing something they shouldn't. I was so taken aback that I just sort of stood there for a moment, totally dumbfounded, until the guy's wife asked me if there was anything else they could help me with. Then when I told her no, she replied with, then I think you better leave. After that, she disappeared into the back again, with her husband flat out refusing to make eye contact with me. I didn't exactly want to make a scene or anything and the whole interaction made for one of the most awkward of my entire life, so I just walked out of the gas station, got back into my car and started off on the drive home. And this is where I started to overthink the whole thing. Or the way I see it, if it was just a town full of rude idiots who didn't want some slick city guy moving out there to bring all his fancy schmancy food, that I could understand. Heck, I'd even appreciate them being honest enough that I wouldn't make the mistake of moving there. But then with a the gas station guy, this wasn't small town xenophobia in his voice when he told me not to move here. It was fear, clear and unmistakable. Then the way he reacted when his wife or whatever that was appeared 
It was like he'd been caught giving away some old dirty secret or something. I mean, he really did act like a scolded child back there, but over what exactly? Like I said, I told my wife about the whole thing the moment I got back home, but I guess she figured that everyone was just kind of being rude. But after hearing it all like this, she admits that she'd have been just as freaked out as I was if it were her in that gas station that day. But all we can do now is wonder what in God's name was going on in that town. And although I know there's no sure way to finding out, it's something I'm nowhere near willing to do. Snooping around that town, poking in other people's business, that sounds like the surest way to me to get killed that I just about ever heard. Besides, whatever it is, I'm not sure I even want to know at all. That gas station attendant didn't seem unfriendly. He seemed like he was trying to warn me. And I'd like to think that I'm smart enough to act on that. I suppose the reason I'm writing this is that you have a pretty big audience and I figure that someone out there has had the same experience as me in the same eerily quiet Midwestern town. Naming it would be pointless. All kinds of people would descend on that place and hunting for all manner of God knows what. And that sounds like the perfect recipe for disaster to me. Anyway, maybe if you read this on your channel you might be able to help solve something that had been bothering me for the longest time now. But if not, if this just seems like some dumb city boy is overreacting to a little rural frostiness, then me and my wife will still be big fans of yours. Keep up the great work. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. During the fall of 1986, Keith and Elaine Dardine of Mount Carmel, Illinois were in the beginning stages of starting a family. They already had a two-year-old son named Peter, but Keith's unemployment meant that they had nowhere to live and no means of providing for their infant child. Yet one day, Keith's relentless job search paid off and he landed the role of plant operator at the Wren Lake Water Conservancy facility over in Ina, Illinois. Ina is a small town of around 1,500 people set on the shores of Wren Lake. First settled by Cherokee refugees in the 1840s, Ina had a long association with tragedy and bloodshed. For many years, it was contemptuously referred to as the reservation by those in neighboring settlements. But by the early 20th century, Ina's citizens were mostly of European or African-American descent. However, as the population demographics slowly began to shift, strange things began occurring around the town, and perhaps the most disturbing of those events involves a man of the cloth named Reverend Lawrence Height. By 1924, the Reverend Height had become a pillar of Ina's community. He was well-liked, well-trusted, and well-visited by the townsfolk who often sought his advice and meditation on a variety of different matters. Yet during the spring of 1924, neighbors noticed that the Reverend was being visited by one of the members of the community a little too often. Elsie Sweeten was young, pretty, and appeared devotedly pious. Yet in reality, she and the Reverend Height were conducting a shockingly illicit affair, one that would only be brought to light after a pair of suspiciously sudden deaths. In July, Elsie Sweeten's husband passed away from an agonizing and protracted illness, yet local coroners were at a loss of his cause of death. Then, less than a month later, the Reverend Height's wife suddenly died by the hands of a rapid and violent affliction. This time, the coroners checked for poisoning and discovered that both corpses tested positive for lethal doses of arsenic. Height and Sweden were both promptly arrested, and searches of their homes uncovered significant quantities of the deadly poison. Both were convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment, yet in the coming months, a rather strange thing happened. Despite being outright convicted of murder, with poison being found in her residence, Elsie Sweeten was granted a retrial, acquitted, and released. A judge ruled that Elsie had been thoroughly corrupted by the Reverend, who had been so overcome with jealousy and lust that he'd seen fit to break the Sixth Commandment. Yet as resolute as Ina's town folk were that the Reverend should face justice, the idea that he had been the corrupter seemed impossible. What's more, how had Sweeten herself landed an acquittal despite playing an integral part in her husband's murder? It seems reasonable to believe that something else was going on, something invisible working just beneath the surface, 
and it was this place that the Dardines chose to call home in the fall of 1986. Keith Dardine secured some temporary accommodation for the family, in the form of a trailer situated on some farmland. To call it humble would be an understatement, but until the paycheck started rolling in, it would have to do. To supplement their income, Elaine Dardine found a job at an office supply store in nearby Mount Vernon, and the couple began socializing by joining a small musical ensemble at a local Baptist church. By mid-1987, the couple had really started to put down roots in the area, and although they were still living in the old trailer, they were happy. Their low overhead costs meant that they lived extremely comfortably, and their living situation afforded them additional savings intended for the purchase of a more permanent home. Yet despite appearances, all was not well beneath the surface. By the fall of 1987, Elaine had started to notice a change in her husband's mood. He seemed to be surviving on less and less sleep and was noticeably more irritable and stressed than usual. On more than one occasion, Elaine asked him if everything was okay, yet Keith would simply brush off her concern with some vague excuse. Ever the patient's spouse, Elaine assumed her husband's disposition would brighten following a change of scenery, but failing that, she soon discovered some other good news to share with him. She was pregnant. Elaine and Keith had been discussing another child for quite some time, with the former believing that the latter would greet news of the conception with joy. Yet to her surprise, Keith was not overjoyed at the news. In fact, he was horrified. When asked what his problem was, Keith only alluded to the couple needing to move as soon as possible. His behavior had worsened to the point of extreme paranoia, yet still he refused to share his fears with his increasingly concerned wife. Finally, after Elaine threatened to move back in with her mother, Keith relented and told her the truth. Ena, the wider region of Jefferson County, was a very violent place, with 15 homicides having been recorded over the previous two years. On top of that, some of these homicides were truly horrifying and defied any kind of rational explanation, and perhaps the worst of those were committed by a young man named Tom Odell. Odell was convicted of killing his parents, 14-year-old sister and two brothers, ages 13 and 10, in 1985. He claimed to have been high on LSD at the time and was taking revenge for years of abuse he'd suffered at the hands of his mother. Yet witnesses stated, although it was fair to characterize Odell's mother as authoritarian, she was by no means abusive, and that Tom's claims that he had been tied up and starved were patently false. In reality... Tom had been engaged in drug use and petty theft since his early teens, and once his 18th birthday rolled around, his parents gave him a choice, grow up and get a job, or move out of the house. Tom found a third option, complete familial annihilation. The Odell family murders were just one of 15 separate incidents of homicide, most of which remain unsolved, and to Keith Dardine, Jefferson County was no place to raise a family. Then after a 15-year-old girl was violated and murdered just a few miles away from where the family lay their heads, Keith reached a breaking point. He purchased a firearm and once threatened to brandish it at a stranger who had knocked at the Dardine's trailer one night asking to make a phone call. Keith seemed convinced it was some kind of setup and when Elaine asked why they as a family might be targeted, Keith gave a cagey and rather unconvincing reply. He was so scared that he was willing to quit his new and well-paying job just to get out of town and by November of 1987, he was frantically searching for a new place to live. But it was already too late, and what came after has become a chilling and enduring mystery. During his time working at the water plant, Keith had been a reliable and punctual employee, so on the morning of November 18th when he failed to show up for work, his supervisor began calling him at home to see if he was okay. After his calls went unanswered, the supervisor then called Keith's parents back in Mount Carmel, but neither had heard from him and assumed that he was at his trailer. With the call having raised his concerns, Keith's father, Don Dardine, contacted the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office and arranged to meet them at his son's trailer in order to perform a welfare check. Don then drove over to the patch of land between Route 37 and the Union Pacific Railroad tracks just north of Franklin County Line where he found the officers waiting for him. 
After getting out of his car and greeting those in attendance, Don produced a spare key to the trailer and, after handing it over to the officer in command, he stepped back and allowed them to do their work. Don later said that he'd had a bad feeling in the pit of his stomach for the whole ride over there, but he hadn't once considered the possibility of the horror which greeted him inside that trailer. In the bedroom, the police discovered the lifeless bodies of Elaine and Peter Dardine, along with the corpse of a newborn baby girl. They had been bound, gagged, tortured, and then beaten to death with a child-sized baseball bat later found at the scene. Elaine had been so badly pulverized that she had gone into labor unwillingly giving birth to her newborn child before she too met the same grisly fate. Keith nor his car were anywhere to be found and at first law enforcement assumed that he'd murdered his family and was attempting to flee. A heavily armed SWAT team rushed to his mother's house in Mount Carmel, but she'd neither seen nor heard from her son in days. The search continued until late the following day when a group of hunters came across Keith's body lying in a wheat field near Wren Lake College. He had been shot, stabbed, and castrated. Although his body had been located, Keith's vehicle remained missing. It was identified as a red 1981 Plymouth, but just as deputies were about to put out an all-points bulletin on the vehicle, they realized something shocking. There was an identical red Plymouth paired right outside the police station in a town called Benton, about 11 miles south of the Dardines trailer. The inside was splattered with blood, blood which had once belonged to Keith Dardine himself. As word of the murders spread through the local community, the already palpable sense of fear only intensified. Some residents went about their business while openly carrying firearms and a total curfew was imposed on anyone under the age of 18. The local high school canceled all outdoor gym classes and additional police officers from neighboring departments were called in to aid in the investigation. Residents were desperate for information, and the limited flow from law enforcement only fueled the fear-based rumor mill. Some purported that Keith was involved in criminality, while others blamed a hidden cult of Satanists for the murder of Elaine's unborn child. However, a third theory, while equally grim, was much more feasible. A family physician based in Jefferson County later told a regional newspaper that many of his patients had confessed to how deeply disturbed they were. One man who lived fairly close to the Dardines trailer told the doctor he was having difficulty sleeping and had lost 14 pounds as a result of the stress. The Dardines landlord's daughter also suffered a great deal of trauma and told her parents that she kept her bedroom light on and was sometimes so scared to fall asleep that she stayed up all night long. When contacted for comment, the Franklin County coroner stated that he felt much of the fear was unjustified. Quote, I don't think there is a rational basis for the near hysteria, he told one newspaper. People are frightening each other. Yet although it was arguably a form of hysteria, people's fears were very real. It was said that if someone ran out of gas in Jefferson County, they would not seek assistance in nearby homes, but would instead walk to the nearest highway and hitch a ride. Such was the level of fear and distrust around Ina. In the aftermath of the coroner's verdict, a task force of around 30 different homicide detectives began working full-time to follow leads and carry out interviews. Yet despite their efforts, progress was hard won. A man taken into custody early on was released after being questioned, as was a co-worker of Keith's who he apparently didn't get along with. Aside from that particular co-worker, no one who knew the couple had anything bad to say about them. The autopsies found no drugs or alcohol in any of the victims, leading police to believe that the small amount of marijuana found at the scene was actually left there by the family's killers. It was determined that the entire family had been murdered at night, and within the space of one hour of each other. Inside the trailer, the killer had apparently taken the time to not only tuck Elaine's body into bed along with her children's bodies, but also to clean up the scene suggesting they did not feel any sense of urgency to leave and that they were fully cognizant of their actions. But despite the scene yielding many clues, the motive of the killer confounded the detectives. The back door had been left open, and there was no evidence of forced entry. A VCR and portable camera were in plain sight in the living room and elsewhere in the house, equally valuable cash and jewelry remained untouched. 
These facts essentially ruled out robbery as the motive and the lack of any sort of carnal violation on any of the bodies precluded any theories of criminal perversion. Both Keith and Elaine were found to be innocent of any kind of extramarital affair, and no such evidence of chronic gambling was discovered, meaning that there was no chance the family had been killed due to exorbitant underworld debt. While some suggested that the Dardines had been randomly targeted by an unhinged criminal element, the Franklin County coroner disagreed. I believe it was a very personal, deliberate thing, he told a regional newspaper, and a police expert on cults agreed that the rumor that Satanists were responsible was untrue. In his experience, such groups would often mutilate bodies more extensively, harvest organs, and leave symbols and lit candles at the scene of their crimes. No such items had been found at the Dardines trailer. However, police did allow for the possibility that there had been a case of mistaken identity by the killer or killers. Keith's mother, Joanne Dardine, later opined that there had been some other motive for killing her son and his family. I think someone wanted Keith to sell drugs and he refused, she said during a 1997 interview. Or there's a possibility someone liked Elaine and she wouldn't accept his advances and he took out his rage on both of them. We just don't know. Before the case officially grew cold, it perplexed two FBI profilers who had traveled down from their Chicago headquarters in order to review evidence. One stated that the crime defied their typical analytic methods and that it was rare for so many possibilities to all hold sway. Joanne Dardine continued her efforts to keep the public from completely losing interest, and throughout the 1990s, she regularly contacted law enforcement to offer possible leads and request new information. However, as time went by, the most likely explanation was whittled down to an early theory that the Dardines had fallen victim to a serial killer. For a short time, law enforcement showed interest in Angel Matarino Resendez, then known by his alias Rafael Resendez Ramirez, following his apprehension by Texas police in 1999. Resendez often traveled around the country by hopping freight trains choosing his victims near the tracks he traveled and often beating them to death. While those elements suggested the Dardines' killings, authorities in Illinois were never able to connect him to the crime. However, it wasn't long before yet another serial killer would come to the attention of local authorities. On December 31st of 1999, a man by the name of Tommy Lynn Sells cut the throats of two girls near Del Rio, Texas, Sells claimed to have suffered blackouts prior to each bloodthirsty crime, which he described as a coping mechanism to deal with the abuse he endured as a child. Miraculously, one of the girls survived the ordeal and went on to aid the police in identifying her attacker. Sells was eventually convicted and sentenced to death, but while he was awaiting trial on the first murder charge, he began confessing to a whole host of other murders. One was the Dardine family. In the mid-1980s, Sells mostly resided near St. Louis, Missouri, and made money from working at traveling carnivals and fairs as a day laborer, or through theft. He hopped rail cars as his primary mode of transportation, and on one such trip through Jefferson County in November 1987, he claimed to have met Keith at a truck stop near Mount Vernon. Sells then claims that Keith invited him home for dinner, and after the meal, Keith apparently angered him by proposing they engage in intimate homosexual relations. Sell's reaction was to force Keith to drive at gunpoint to the location he was killed, and after castrating him, Sells returned to eliminate the witnesses. I was just so angry that I took it to the maximum limit, Sells later explained. Rage don't have a stop button. However, Sells later brought his reliability into disrepute by completely changing his story. In his second version, after spotting the Dardine trailer with its for sale sign outside, he saw an opportunity to commit a heinous act of violence. He could maim, kill, then dispose of the Dardines, and people might assume they'd just move on. After all, Sells knew firsthand that little attention is afforded to the poor and the destitute. After drinking beers and waiting for the right time, he knocked on the door and told a wary Keith that he was interested in buying the trailer. Then after gaining entry, Sells overpowered his unsuspecting victim and forced him at gunpoint to bind and gag his wife and son with duct tape. Once the act was completed, 
Sells drove Keith out to the field, where he castrated him, shot him, then left him there to die. To some, Sells' eventual execution was justice for the Dardines. Even though he was never charged with their murders, both the Jefferson County State's Attorney and Sheriff Roger Mulch agreed that he remained the number one suspect. And this was down to the fact that although Sells had completely changed his story at one point, he was privy to information that only a select group of investigators knew. In their eyes, there was no doubt that Sells had committed the murders, or had at least been present when the crimes had occurred. The fact some of his statements completely contradicted the evidence didn't seem to bother the investigators, who deduced that Sells was attempting to cover for an accomplice by taking sole responsibility. Regardless of his involvement in the Dardines murders, police in Texas confirmed Sells was responsible for 22 murders. However, many began to suspect that Sells was inflating his body count in order to avoid the death penalty. By continually confessing to murders he was not connected to, Sells could either arrange a plea bargain or could delay his demise for as long as he could deceive the authorities for, and in the process, scores of killers might potentially avoid justice. Yet only one thing was abundantly clear. Sells wasn't telling the whole truth regarding his interactions with Keith. For one, friends, family, and investigators were extremely skeptical that Keith would have just invited a stranger home for dinner. If he wouldn't let a young girl in to use the phone, he wouldn't let a grown man in, a friend later said. They also refuted Sells' claim that Keith made advances on him. The detectives who interviewed Sells believed that if he did indeed kill the Dardines, he invented that detail to make the crime seem more justified. At first, Keith's mother was convinced of Sell's guilt and actually wanted to meet with him at one point in order to obtain a degree of closure. I've always wanted to know every detail, she said. Some people may think that's gory, but when someone does something to my family, I want to know why. Sells, on the other hand, remained averse to any potential meeting. Joanne wants to talk to me. If she wants to come here and talk to me, scream at me, yell, kick me, hit me, she should have that right, he said. But sorry, ain't gonna cut it. So what's there to say? I could tell her sorry every day for the rest of my life. It's not gonna stop her pain. And one thing I do know about is pain. And it don't go away. However, on the eve of Cell's execution, Joanne Dardine revealed that doubt had crept into her mind of late. There's just a little bit of doubt there, she told journalists. Not that he didn't do it. I'm wondering if maybe somebody helped him. The two never did get around to having that meeting, but by the time of Sell's 2014 execution, Joanne had come to believe that he was not the man who killed her son, daughter-in-law, and grandchildren. I wanted him to stay alive until I know positively that he didn't do it, she told the Associated Press shortly following Sell's time of death. The things he said do not match up with what I know about Keith. A lot of people think it's done and over with, but to me, it's not. For me personally, it will never, ever be over. Thankfully, I don't have any personal stories to share with you, which makes me kind of lucky, I guess. But my uncle from my mom's side has a pretty good one from when they were kids. My mom claims to have zero recollection of this, but she was a baby at the time, so go figure. It all involves a potential move that my grandpa was looking at and the house he was going to renovate before the move. So the story goes that my grandparents needed to upsize from their double Y to their first real house. My grandma was in the latter stages of her pregnancy with my mom, so my grandpa went off searching for somewhere to live. The trouble was, money wasn't exactly flush at that period, so instead of buying a brand new house, Grandpa chose a fixer-upper. And from what I heard, boy did he choose a fixer-upper. The place was practically in ruins, but to Grandpa, that was a positive. In his mind, he was just purchasing the land, and he had big plans for it. Grandpa and his buddy got to work clearing out the house, and while they were waiting for some plumber or something to come out, they got to work on the backyard. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but apparently the soil was completely ruined or spoiled or whatever happens to lawns, so they wanted to dig it up and replace it. They'd need to hire someone to bring in all the new soil and whatnot, but they could get to work on the digging themselves. And that's when they found this big, buried stash 
of bones. The fact that one of them happened to quite obviously be an animal skull, they figured that it was just some old pet grave or something. But then, they later found another skull, and then another, and another, and the more they dug, the more bones they uncovered. Only then they found a big one, one way too big to just be an animal bone, so that's why they called the cops. Once they got up there, the cops told them that they'd probably just uncovered one of the biggest animal cruelty cases in the state's history, but once the larger bone was confirmed as being human remains, things got way more serious. The whole place became a crime scene, so my grandpa couldn't do any work on the place for like a year while the cops dug the entire place up, searching for more burial sites. When my grandma heard this, there was no way on God's green earth that she was about to go raise a family in a place like that. And in the end, Grandpa was forced to wait until the whole thing had blown over before selling the land on to someone else at a discount rate. The whole thing was a big setback during that early period as a family and for years, Grandpa used to catch a whole bunch of crap about his cheapskate self accidentally buying some psycho's homemade cemetery instead of somewhere that they could, you know, actually live. I asked about the bones and if they ever worked out who it belonged to or how it had gotten there. But no, aside from one visit to the local sheriff's office to give an account of how they'd found the bones, the cops never got back in touch with them. Well, besides again when they were packing up their stuff and they could actually access the land again of course. But they didn't ever get to find out if it was a murder, a family grave of some kind, or even when the bones had been buried. They just took everything off to a lab and that was pretty much it. I've always wondered what those bones were all about and if they might have been some weirdly innocent explanation for it all. If they were from a time when people and animals just got buried where they lay, like the old frontier settlers or something, then that'd make a lot more sense. But something just seems real off about all those bones, and I have a bad feeling that they were way more than just the bones of someone's beloved pets. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST. And there are some super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official. And you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below in the description. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, a lobotomy a day keeps everything away.